Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, nice to see you all here. I have to say, um, I think it's really great news with what we just saw happen today, this morning, and early afternoon in terms of our upcoming fiscal year budget, both operating and CIP. And I'm extremely grateful to Council Member and Budget Chair Ann Kobayashi for her hard work and every single one of the Council Members for the end of the day coming together and putting Core City Services first in the City and County of Honolulu. And it couldn't happen without the team that stands with me here today, both Nelson Koyonagi and Gary Kurakawa, um, and of course, Ember Shin, our Managing Director. And I would like to particularly thank Ember for her really hard work. Um, she keeps all of us um, on a tight schedule in terms of the budget. And I'm very grateful, and I think um, we're working closely with the Council. Sometimes it was a little rough. At the end of the day, it resulted in a budget where we remain committed again, as I say, to Core City Services. And it's part of an example of what I mean when I talk about Core City Services. One of the major jobs of any mayor anywhere in the country is public safety. And just as you know, this morning, one of our firefighters was putting out a fire over in Kailua and was injured, not critically, and he's going to be okay. But this is an example of finding funds to make sure that our first responders uh, get the, the benefits they need, the pay they need, the training they need to make us one of the safest big cities in the United States of America. But the other core city services that we focused on in this administration for the past year and a half and will continue to do so are things like road repaving. So it looked like for a while that we were okay with our road repaving. We went in, went in with a $140 million request. Um, it looked pretty strong. We're down at 132. And in the last days of the budget cycle, it got knocked down to about 100. Very concerning because it would have a negative impact in out years in terms of road repaving. The good news is the council came back and restored the full re the funding up to 132 million, and we're very grateful for that. Our parks talk about our front doors. We need to treat them. I mean, our front yards, and we should treat them like our front yards. Um, good news there is we have 65 million dollars in operating. Uh, expenses to make sure our parks are better maintained and looking for di different when we go to, into them. $39 million for CIP, that means for construction, making things better in our parks like our bathrooms, playground equipment, and so forth. And $5 million for some legacy projects like Alamoana Beach Park, our People's Park, that all of us use no matter where we live on this island. Thomas Square, our oldest park in the state, one of the oldest in the nation, was a park before we became part of the United States and of course our Blaisdell Corridor. These are things that we're very, very excited about. Bus routes, as you know, we came in and the new administration and restored nine routes. And we continue to look for funds to continue to restore more routes. And the good news is the council actually gave us five million more to look at route restoration. So we're gonna look to see where we put them into place. Of course, we'll work with the council members. We're gonna make absolutely certain it's where the community needs the most because our bus transportation is about social equality. It's about making sure that those who cannot afford to travel by car every day have another way to get back and forth to and from work, to get to the doctor, to see their family, and just live a better life. And then finally, sewers. $270 million for sewers. Something we absolutely need to do if we're going to build housing for that next generation um, of young folks that are coming up. And of course, rail, that's separate budget item, but rail, as we all know, is, is on track. Some of the other things I want to talk about that, that came into play um, throughout the budget cycle was our very, very um, ambitious housing first approach. As you know, this administration, from the time we came in, have been working very hard to address the evolving and changing problem of homelessness. And one thing we did is we took a more aggressive but compassionate way to approach it through our stored property ordinance and sidewalk nuisance law. We had crews out there more often, and then we had a permanent crew that we put together that was going out at 2 in the morning when parks are closed and moving people and stuff off of sidewalks so that our sidewalks and other areas remained open and free for everyone. And we've had some visual positive impact. You go to Thomas Square, it looks really good and has been for a long time. Inha Park has been looking good for quite a long time now. Going into Waikiki on Kalakaua right before the bridge, looking good and has been for a long time. Other areas have not been looking so good, like Waikiki. And so one thing, we've had our, our, our crew in Waikiki for two weeks now. I went there last night before the sunset, spent three hours walking around. 
it looks much better. Police officers came up to me and said, it's much better. Residents who walk around there came up to me and said, Mayor, what are you doing? It looks so much better. But these kind of things are a one, just one aspect of it. We're going to do the compassionate disruption, hoping that people will move into shelters. But we've been told time and time again by the experts from around this country who have actual factual proof that it works is we need to establish a model. We call it housing first. You can call it whatever you want. It's permanent supportive housing. It's getting homeless, chronic homeless in particular, whether they be families or others, into a, show, into a place, a home, and then they're treated for their mental illness and addictions. And get better. Because they say, no, get better first and then move into a shelter. That never happens. And so all we do is move people from sidewalk to sidewalk to park to park, spending $15,000 every time we do it without the long-term improvement. And so we needed the Housing First model. We put $18.9 million in, all coming out of affordable housing fund. This is a fund that's been collected by half a percent, half a cent, half a percent, half a cent, half a cent, and it's being held. And we wanted to use that money. We thought it made the most sense. We weren't increasing debt. We weren't raising taxes. We were finding a fund that had not been used and applying it to Housing First. And unfortunately, that money went other places once our proposal went down to the council. Not all of it, but a big chunk of it. And we struggled to try to keep it there. We also struggled long and hard to make sure that we had the administrative support. We needed money to make sure whatever program we did had the administrative support because the Housing First model is labor intensive. We're taking people who have a hard time taking care of themselves and we're putting them into a unit with other people living around them that expect good behavior. And to make sure that happens, we need the administrative aspect to deal with landlords, to make sure if there's problems, they're being responded to, and of course we have to have the supportive services. That's you know the treatment for drug and alcohol abuse, for mental disorders, and make sure that they're getting better. It's healthcare. Healthcare. These are things that are that are that are not cheap. The good news is we do still have three million dollars to jumpstart this program through rental assistance and for supportive services. Why do I like this? We need to do things quickly at this point, particularly in certain communities like Waikiki and Chinatown and the Leeward Coast. People are saying, you need to act, and we don't have two or three years to see the result. We need to see results next week, and I'm anxious to do exactly that. And that's why I like the 18.9 million. Um, but the good news, and there's good news here, is the council has come and recognized the incredible importance of, of housing our homeless, whether they be families, our chronic homeless individuals, our working poor, and our families who may have not be as, as fortunate. And so they've dedicated $32 million towards this approach in the final days of the council. Up to then, it was not really being discussed. And last Thursday, of course, they said, let's use $32 million, first out of a road repaving program, and, and then today, as you saw at the floor draft, out of issuing uh, general obligation bonds. We're going to work really hard to use this money. Um, this can only be used as CIP money. So unlike the, uh, the money that was coming out of the Affordable Housing Fund, which we could use for all kinds of things, as you know, obligation bonds, CIP money, can only be used for rehabbing of existing units, purchasing of, of buildings or units, or building units. And as you can imagine, those three things I just discussed doesn't happen in a week or two weeks or even a month, it's going to take a while before we have the units in place to move people from a sidewalk, park, or street into a unit. And so that's a little bit, well, we appreciate the money. It's going to take a little longer to do. The other thing is because we're not using the affordable housing funds, we're using general obligation um, bonds, issuing bonds that will be paid back over 20 years, that's about $54 million that we're all going to be paying to get $32 million worth of CIP money being spent. And so I'm troubled, I'm worried about our you know, debt service, but at the same time, we need to address our low-income working families, our homeless, fam homeless families, and our chronic homeless. And it's gonna be a challenge, by the way, because you guys remember, 20 years ago, the city and county of Honolulu was in the housing business. Remember Eva Villages and those kinds of programs? And we got out of the business. We have now been put smack dab back into the housing business again with this $32 million. And with no funding for administrative support, it is a real challenge. 
but we're going to look for every opportunity we can find. And Pam Woody Oakland, where's Pam? Is here, standing right here. She's critical in this, and she realizes the challenge she faces, and as you know, her Department of Community Services does a great job with Section 8, does a great job with other aspects of, of our housing affordability, but she is going to be pushed to the extreme to get this program running. She's going to work really hard, and we're going to find every opportunity we can. We may not be able to spend all $32 million. We're going to spend what we can use effectively. We're not going to waste one dollar. We're not going to build, buy, or rehab a unit and not be able to place a family or an individual into a unit without success, because then we set the whole program up for failure. But we're appreciative of the Council's commitment, dedication, and we're going to work as hard as humanly possible to make sure we're successful in this program. And we need to be, so we can do the enforcement part and then the housing part, and then I think we see real improvement for the long term. The other thing I just want to mention is, you know, last year there was the issue of grants and aid. Um, and as you know, a charter amendment was passed about two years ago, put to the people to vote on. They voted for it, where they said a half a percent of the general revenue would be set aside. That's about $5 million. That a process would be put in place through a committee that would score um, applications based on criteria set by the council, and there would be no earmarks, no political decision making by individual council members for their favorite not for profit. And we all have our favorite not for profits. I have my favorite not for, not for profits. But we said, let's leave it up to a committee. The committees worked hard last year, the committee worked hard this year, they scored, ranked, and what has happened is that, again, instead of living with just the five million that was set aside, they added another five million to grants and aid. Now, where does that put us in comparison to the state? Our operating budget just passed was a little over two billion dollars. What was the state's operating budget just passed last month? Eleven billion dollars. We both are spending ten million dollars on grants and aid, and I believe something is out of whack here. We have asked for increases in revenue. We have asked the legislature to give us more in TAT. And we did. We got $4 million. I wish we would have had 30 So to turn around and instead of using it for core city services, we're using that additional money, hard-earned, taxpayer-paid money, to support different not-for-profits on an earmarked basis. And I'm, I, I'm troubled by that. So whether I release this money, like I didn't last year release this money, again, I think the policy here is I'm going to honor how the people voted, how the Charter Amendment stands, and follow the process that was put in place. But overall, I'm really happy. And I think everyone in the city and county of Honolulu has to be very grateful to the city council, to the administration, for coming together and putting together a budget that puts core city services first, front and center. And like any process, you know, things work out this way. You don't get whatever, everything you want. We didn't get everything we wanted. Council didn't get everything they wanted. And perhaps that's the best way that a budget process should work. With that, I'll open it up to any other questions. Ms. Amber, you have anything? Did I, did I left anything out? No? Mayor, okay, uh, yes. You said that you wanted to spend $18.9 million for housing first. I think we all need some clarification as to how much the council set aside for housing first, both in the operating budget and the CIP budget. Okay, so, um, and Amber, maybe, do you want to jump in and answer that part? Why don't you jump in? $12.2 come here, come here. in the um, CIP budget out of the Affordable Housing Fund and $3 million in the operating budget. And that both, both those, all that funding can be used for the rental assistance, paying the rent, putting no. people in it. No, the three million dollars can be used for any rental assistance program, but the affordable housing money still has to be used for acquisition and maintenance, um, rehab. Uh, of, uh, but it's cash; it's not bond money; it's cash money. So we have a lot more flexibility in how we use it. And then the thirty-two million is what. Uh, and I want to have what. What the uh, managing director, when she says it's cash, you can use the cash and give it to others to do things with. We can partner um, with other developers or um, not just buying it for ourselves and taking title, but we can partner with other types of affordable housing development where they will dedicate units to housing first use, those kinds of things. And it can help us implement the program quicker, right? Because there's others out there already doing this. We go to them with this money, so we want to partner with you and they get it in the field quicker. With obligation bonds and CIP money, we have to do it ourselves, and that takes longer. And again, action is where we want to see happen more quickly. 
Mayor, do you anticipate build, building new <coughs> properties specifically for housing first? I know there's the White Key project, but do you anticipate going beyond the White Key project? We're going to look at everything, Andrew. I mean, we will look at, are there units, individual units we just rehab and make them work? Um, we will look at any opportunities for buildings we could change over, and um, of course, building. And we're, everything's on, on the table. We'll look at everything, and of course, my preference would be things that we can do more quickly. So for me, that's rehabbing apartments. I also favor more the scattered housing approach. I think that those who have been on the street a very long time, placing them in units around the city is better than creating one large building where everyone is housed because people react in a negative way sometimes when, when people move into their communities. So I think if it's less of an impact, there's going to be less in pushback. There's always going to be some pushback, and we all recognize that, but we have to live with this if we're going to really make a dramatic difference in our homeless population here on this island. So council members targeted some of them, diverted some of the money uh, into some of their own projects. You know, there was one in Waikiki, one in Ivole. Is it the administration's intent to uh, carry forward with those projects as they had proposed? So, for example, the $4 million set aside for Waikiki, we actually met with the developer of that project. Um, we're looking, like I said, we're going to look at everything. The fact that a council member of identified a specific project where we didn't, we just put in the money, said we'll look at everything, we want to find out. So we sat down with the developer, we, we expressed an interest. Um, I was hoping he could do it more quickly when he said somewhere in mid-2017, I was well, I don't know if Waikiki can wait to 2017. And by the way, that project, 4 million, gets you somewhere between 10 and 24 units. So that's not a lot of people. By 2017, I think there's going to be 10 to 24 more chronic homeless people in Waikiki. But we're going to look at it. I think it's a project worthy of, of consideration. The Villay project, um, we've had meetings um, both here in my office and outside of this office. And in fact, our chief of staff has met with some of the people in that area, some of the landowners, to talk about what can we do? So, you know, Councilmember Fukunaga has talked about this. We'll look into it to see what we can do. Again, there's no one approach here. This solving of our homeless challenge is multifaceted, and it's going to be in a lot of different areas. And we're going to look at the ones that make the most sense, get the largest bang for your dollar, and have the quickest impact possible. Mary, some of, the, some of that money went to projects that didn't necessarily benefit the homeless, but folks who needed affordable housing. Uh, there was the, uh, the prosecutor's project up in Makiki. Uh, they were talking up about a Pai Foundation project in Kakaako. Are those projects you're going to be able to support? Um, actually, you know, we had $2 million for this art loss. I think that's what you're talking about. So it is something we supported. But again, the 18.9 that we put in when, when we put our budget in was money that we wanted to apply to the most um, critical population, those who needed the most help, the ones who were getting the most complaints from, because we believe the people of this island are demanding that that problem be addressed front and center, quickly and first of all. And so that's where our focus was. Now some members felt we should look at other areas. We'll look at them. Um, but again, my focus, I'm speaking just for myself, my focus, and I believe our focus, Ember, Pam, and the rest of us, is to address that, that, that most critical part of our population is causing the greatest number of problems and the greatest economic impact. This is the population that creates issues on the streets. This is the population that ends up in emergency uh, wards that we all pay for. This is the population that's negatively impacting our visitor industry experience, and that's why we're going there first. So what does this do to the timeline? I, mean, I, I just wanted to ask Gordon's question. I'm sorry. Gordon, you know, the affordable housing money has two restrictions. It has to serve the 50% AMI population and the housing unit has to be held in perpetuity to serve the 50%. Yes. So those two projects that you mentioned, we will look at it to see if it, it can be, if affordable housing money can actually be used within those restrictions. So it isn't off the table. It, we just don't know these answers to these two restrictions. Okay. But the art loss is a, it's a great program and it works well in other parts around our country and we spent you know, a number of meetings in here talking about the concept. The mayor and member, of, you know, just given some of the ambitious goals to end chronic homelessness within two years and things, I guess having the restrictions on the money, though, how, how does that affect the timeline? I mean, does that kind of along those goals? Um, Tim, good question. I think any kind of restrictions or provisions uh, on how we spend the money does make it more difficult for us to be as effective and as efficient and, and react as quickly. Um, you know, we'll work within those restrictions. 
Uh, for me personally, you know, I would never make the promise that I can end chronic homelessness, but I can promise that I'll work as hard as possible every single day with the team that stands with me and the other in the city, others in the city administration to address the problem and show improvement. And I believe we're showing some improvement. And with the funding that we've gotten, I think we'll show much more improvement and work towards addressing the issue of getting people out of streets and parks and into permanent supportive housing. Mayor, you had uh, suggested that you weren't going to release the extra $5 million in grants. Um, it looks like the council added another about $40 million in other CIP projects to the budget. Are you um, planning to release that money? I'll look at it case by case. And if a, if a good argument is made, I'll look at it. Grants and aid, by the way, grants and aid is different than the council, as they call it, council ads. Um, you know, the grants and aid is because the reason why I stand so firmly on this is that I do believe in honoring the charter, just like our Constitution. A question was put out by the council. This charter amendment was proposed by the council, saying, let's do it differently. And the people said, okay, I agree, let's do it differently. So I want to honor that and not say, well, let's do it differently, and let's keep doing it the same. So I have strong policy reasons for it. On the grants and aid, I mean, for the GIA, CIP, GIA, I mean, CIP ads, capital improvement ads, I will look case by case. Um, always being concerned about the amount of money that we have for debt service, our debt limit, and what are the merits of the project. But like all of us in the room, reasonable people, we'll say, I'll sit down and listen to why, and if there's a strong argument why, we'll go ahead and release. Mayor, with this, uh, with this budget, is the city still at or below the 20% threshold for uh, debt limit? We are below. And we're always watching that. Mayor, uh, Ernie Martin had said that <coughs> in the new floor amendment or that just passed, um, the focus is going to be, at least the first priority is going to be the working homeless um, or homeless with families. Does that in any way hamstring you in terms of your initiative for the chronic homeless, the hardest to help, the street population? So one thing I do want to emphasize, because it, it seems that it, it doesn't get through, when we talk about chronic homeless in people, we're talking about families. There are chronic homeless families, and there are chronic homeless individuals. And the population changes where you go around our island. And our commitment is to house as many chronic homeless people in the communities that we find them. And so we focused on three areas, Waikiki, Chinatown, and the Leeward Coast. If we get in the car and drive an hour and a half, well, now maybe two hours, um, we'll see a lot of families. And we want to house those families that have been chronically homeless. And in Waikiki, you're going to see a lot of individuals, and we want to house more of those. So the focus is on chronic homeless, whatever type of homeless people they are. Now, I know there's a proviso they put in with an, a, kind of an indication from the council that they want us to focus on the working poor and, and homeless families. And we will look at that, too. Of course, Pam Woody Oakland here, her programs are looking at those kinds of folks every single day. And the good news are many families are housed because if you're a father and a mother with one or two or three children and you get an opportunity to move off the street or in the bushes into a shelter or into a house, what do you think you do? You go. And the good news is we do house many of our families. The other side is we house very few of our chronic individuals because they don't want to go. They're okay on the street unless it's less convenient to stay on the street or they get permanent supportive housing where they can be their illnesses and addictions can be addressed while having a place to stay. Mayor, uh, Councilman Ifakang Anderson um, uh, pretty much gave it to the state for only setting aside one and a half million for, for housing first, uh, being a former majority leader of anything that you have to say about the, I guess, the, the one and a half million that's going to be right. You know, I think this, I would like to see the state step up and do more. Um, I believe that they have the financial wherewithal to do more. They also have uh, you know, the, the, the personnel in place. But just like us, um, they're struggling with what's the best way to approach it. And of course, the state does have a lot of housing properties, that they're, they're housing people who have an issue, have problems finding housing. And by the way, if the state didn't have all those units, I'm talking about the tens of thousands, I think, probably, they would be homeless too and on our streets. So I want to give the credit to the state for their part of it. There's not just one way to approach it. You gotta keep those who are on the verge of becoming homeless from falling into homelessness, and the state is helping tremendously with that. But I think 
we need to look for more support from the state for our Housing First model because I do believe it works. Um, you can hear Colin Kippen today talking about it. He's committed. The governor and I have a strong working relationship. We meet on a regular basis. We've been talking, including, you know, about other initiatives we've been able to do that deal with Housing First. Um, but I share Ikaika Council um, Vice, Vice Chair Ikaika Anderson's, uh, I guess he's calling out to the state, and I think it's a fair call out. Can you speak briefly about the hockey sale and the machinations that have been going on? We've heard from the managing director, we've heard from Sam about it, but can you get your thoughts on where this is going? You know, I was I was very disappointed that the hockey sale failed the last round. And um, for me, I spent most of my life in the private sector, and I always I, my experiences from when I was on the other side is that the private sector is always worried when they deal with government at any level, because in poli you know it's about politics, and and politics can change uh, how things go as you move down the pike. And so we had a we had people working on this on this sale for almost three years, and at the end of the cycle politics kicked into the process um, in terms of you know resolutions being put in and then even arguing about how the money was going to be spent before the money was actually there was no sale yet and it fell apart unfortunately so now we're starting again but as you can see there's some politics entering already in terms of restrictions and how it can be done and where it's going to be done you know what units in what place and I am concerned that one, those who are still interested may get a little shaky thinking, oh, we saw what happened last time, do we really want to engage in this? And we may lose some very solid, serious, interested parties and they may walk away and we want the best bids possible. Um, so my request would be to everyone step back from the politics and let the process work itself out and not to micromanage this. If it doesn't work, we could end up with a failed uh, initiative two or three years down the road. And here's the sad part. One, we spend $7 million every year uh, in lost revenue because of the projects, the 12 projects we have. And two, I do believe that the private sector under proper management will do a better job and actually create buildings and units that would be better for everyone that lives there. And so I support this, but I'm concerned and worried that perhaps all the hard work will end up with not much to show for it unless everyone steps back and lets the process work itself out. And once the, the units are sold, if there's money on the table, then there can be a discussion as how it's spent. Mayor, the, the last budget cycle, I believe you did not sign the operating uh, budget bill. Uh, it sounds like everything that we've heard you say today that you're leaning towards signing both the budget bill and the CIP bill for, for this budget cycle. So uh, I will look. We want to see the final product that comes up. We'll give it to Corporation Council for a uh, uh, the review to make sure everything in there is proper. Um, at that point, I'll make the decision. You know, right now I'm leaning to sign our budget, the operating and CIP budget. Of course, um, the the heart budget was also before the council, and um, in all likelihood, I will not sign that budget. I'm sorry, you said you will not. I would not. I'll let it go into law without my signature, as I did last year, as Mayor Carlo did his two years before. Can you explain for us the reasons why? Because I believe that under the um, Charter Amendment setting up HART, HART was, was designated uh, the, the entity to build rail, and it was to take politics out of the system, because before that I was the managing director. It sat with um, Division of Transportation Services, of which the, the, the director was appointed by me. And um, I believe that people felt that instead of letting politics weigh in into how we build and how we spend the money to build, it should be done by a quasi-independent agency. Again, I respect that. There was a charter amendment. So that the fact that the council reviews that budget, I think, is not appropriate. And I don't think they have the authority. I'm not going to veto it, because I believe in, in the rail project. It's extremely important. It's, it's a game changer for our entire community. Um, but I probably will not sign it. Now, again, it'll go before our, our corporation council for review. If the opinion or decision has changed, then maybe I would sign it, but I don't think it will. Mayor, are you concerned at all about the very last minute nature of um, the floor amendments that came forward? Um, there's Ernie Martins and then um, Councilman uh, Anderson at the last minute proposed something today. Do you feel like you guys had enough time to review what they were changing and provide your testimony? Um, having been in the State House and just being an observer, all, like all of us in the room of politics, you know, it's something that is frustrating when this happens. I don't like it. I do believe that 
when amendments are done at the very last minute, particularly very large ones like this, where we're spending you know tens of millions of additional money, um, it would been better to start in the beginning of the process. Quite frankly, I don't understand what became so urgent between March and now. We had almost 20 million for housing first, and much of it was deleted, and then three or four days before the finalization of the budget, all of a sudden now we've got to deal with this problem. So um, that's frustrating for me, but at the end of the day, it, I think it worked out. Um, I think Ikaika Anderson stepped in to try to salvage it. Um, so when you have choices like this, do we cut, dramatically cut road repaving that everyone likes and everyone wants and we're showing we're doing? Um, perhaps there's another middle way, and I think he was trying to find a middle way to do it. And so I wouldn't fault the vice chair for, for trying. And again, it ended up with a budget that I said when I walked out here that I'm very pleased to have. And I think it, because it preserves our core city services and, and improves what we're doing for all the people of this island. Mayor, uh, real quickly, dovetailing on road repaving, uh, have you spent all the prior year um, uh, set aside for road repavement and, and now that you got the additional 132 million for this budget? So we're into the fiscal year 14 money now. As you know, there's about a year lag. Because you, you get the money, you don't spend it the next day, right? You have to design um, the, the projects that we're going to do. Um, then they have to be put out to bid, they have to be processed, and then awarded. And so there is a lag, uh, but the good news is we've encumbered all of the... Th when I came in, there was 12 and 13, fiscal year 12 and 13 money. We encumbered that. We've repaved almost 600 lane miles at this point, I think, in a year and a half. We're way ahead of our, our target. And um, we are encumbering... We're eating into the 14... Uh, fiscal year, which passed six six months ago, and by July of next year, we'll have encumbered the bulk of that money, but there will be still, still be 14 money. Um, one thing I found out really quickly when I came out and looked at, you know, setting this very ambitious target for road repaving is that the private sector says we will ramp up, we'll hire more crews, we'll build more batch plants, we'll purchase equipment that we're going to amortize over a number of years if there's a firm commitment to fully fund this program. But if we, just like Hoppy, if we see you getting weak a year and a half into the program, and that was my fear with this cut of $32 million, it could mean we're backing off. We're going to send our crews to other islands. We're not going to purchase this equipment because you don't show the commitment. And I wanted to send a clear message every year that we're committed, so they're committed. It's a partnership here. And so I think what we've done is by restoring the $32 million, we've sent a message to the private sector that repays most of these roads that we're on a firm course with the backing of the council. So please continue to keep, commit in your capital investment and we'll continue to commit the funds to repave all our roads in the next now four years. We all our bad roads, the 43% that are substandard. we got time for one or two more questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll stick around for individual. Some bulky items. You're, you're, oh. you're being, you're so fast. You know, I, I, I still haven't looked at the bill. I know it went in yesterday. Um, as you know, I'm, I, one, I think we're doing a much better job with our bulk item pickup. When I came in, there was a lot of complaints. There still are complaints, but it's gotten better, and if we drive around, you'll see in most places, it looks pretty good. It remains a problem in Macaulay and Moilili because of all the condos there, um, and there's not enough enforcement from the condo associations. Um, but if there's a way to make it better by doing this call, most jurisdictions around the country don't have automatic pickup. You call and arrange pickup. In many cases, it's a private company that does it. Um, but the call to arrange for pickup may address the problem of people putting it out whenever they want. And two, if there's a way to um, raise some revenue off of this, I'm obvi obviously very interested. As you know, we're the only county of the four counties. There's one county, the Big Island, that doesn't have curbside pickup. There's not curbs on the Big Island in most places. You can arrange private pickup. But both Kauai, Kauai and Maui do have um, pickup by the county, and they charge for it. And most jurisdictions around the country do. And I'm hoping that sooner or later we get on board and do that. Because, again, what my concern is we have this, this refuse fund that is shrinking, 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 while the costs go up, up, and up. It's not sustainable. And what we're doing is we're taking our real property tax collections and we're dumping it into this fund to maintain the service. And I want to bring greater balance and more sustainability. So maybe bulky autumn is a way to do it. I appreciate uh, Budget Chair Kobayashi's attempts to look at it. She says it's a pilot. We'll look at it. We'll follow the process uh, as the bill moves forward and see if it's something we can work, uh, make it work. And if it can, we'll try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the way it's been. Thank you.